All right, how's it, how's it going, everyone? Nice to see a, a full lecture theatre for once. Um, uh, yeah, um, I uh, am a PhD student um, at uh, this university, um, and I'm looking at uh, the bird side of black box. So, I mean, kind of Emily took things off track a bit with the frogs. Um, but I, if I could just squeeze in from, from where Anne left off uh, on the black box, I'll, um, I'll, I'll take a, a slightly more avian tack. Um, so, uh, the floodplains along the, the River Murray create um, what's known as a, a green corridor, um, a, a long green kind of snaking area of productive woodlands in what is otherwise essentially a, a semi-arid system. Um, and in this landscape, uh, the black box woodlands form an ecotone between uh, the red gums right along the river and the Mallee woodland uh, up in the uh, higher areas. Um, and they're thought to act as refugia for bird species, um, maybe during drought or perhaps um, they might be critical during uh, certain times of the year. Um, but actually very little is known about the exact role that the woodlands play um, for these bird communities. So as um, probably most of you are aware, um, the Murray-Darling Basin has undergone fairly widespread alterations in its hydrology um, and this has reduced flood frequency, uh, and flood magnitude, and without, without adequate flooding, black box trees are susceptible to damage from salinity. Um, and because of this, um, as Anne mentioned, we're seeing um, uh, very little recruitment in black box trees. Um, we're seeing a widespread decline in the condition of these woodlands as well. And things like climate change and extended drought are really only, only going to increase these threats. Um, so uh, as a... Uh, bird nerd, if you will, I'm interested in what the implications of this, uh, these changes are for the bird communities using these habitats. Um, but unfortunately we know actually very little about how birds use these woodlands. Um, so at the moment it's difficult for us as scientists to tell managers and governments uh, how to effectively conserve uh, these environments. And the best way um, to address this is of course by collecting data, because uh, we're all good scientists here, we get it. Uh, so this is where my project comes in. Um, so I uh, had study sites um, uh, where I surveyed at three locations along the Murray River, at um, Chowilla, just right up on the New South Wales Victoria border, um, Cowprom Station, just north of Renmark, and Cataratco, just south of Berry. And at each location, I undertook two hectare, 30-minute uh, area searches uh, in red gum, Mallee, and uh, both healthy and degraded black box. So there's a, a fairly big difference in the, uh, in the condition there. Um, and this allowed the comparison of bird communities uh, between each habitat type and, and um, yeah, shows which, uh, which birds each habitat type supports. So this is an ordination of all my survey sites. Um, and uh, these are my 36 survey sites. Um, color-coded, um, although it might be a bit hard to see. The, the red ones are red gum. We've got healthy black box up here, um, Mallee in the uh, purple, and then degraded black box down here. Um, and ordination is essentially plots, plot um, points according to the similarity of the data. So this is, this is plotting my sites according to the similarity of their bird communities. Um, now the most similar bird communities uh, were found in uh, healthy black box and in Mallee. There was the, um, the highest similarity between those two, which makes sense when you go out to these places um, and you look at the birds and they actually share lots of bird species. A lot of the birds in black box are thought to be traditionally Mallee species. Um, but as you can see, there is still clear clustering um, of sites within each habitat type, um, which tells us that different bird species are consistently uh, using particular woodland types. Um, and now that might be unsurprising, but it's important information because it tells us that there's a unique bird assemblage in each habitat type. But what's particularly interesting is uh, how different most of the degraded sites are to any other site. Um, the spread of those points indicate that there is, um, in contrast to all the other habitats, there's very little um, consistent community composition in the birds that were found there. And indeed, all, uh, almost all bird species um, were negatively associated with degraded black box when compared with healthy black box. So this graph shows um, uh, the average number of birds recorded uh, in both these habitats over two years of surveys, and the differences um, are all significant every season. Um, so pretty clearly, uh, degraded black box, despite having uh, being the same species, you could look at larger florins, um, they're not 
performing the same role for birds as healthy black box um, woodlands are. So from here it's per pertinent to ask, um, I guess, what drives the composition of these bird communities in each of these habitats? Why are we seeing the patterns that we're seeing? Um, so the next step was to uh, quantify and compare habitat components between sites. So it was plant surveys, my favourite thing. Um, so uh, a number of habitat components were measured at each site. Um, and these surveys showed that uh, things like tree density, tree height, um, vegetation cover and the amount of leaf litter were all significantly lower in degraded black box. Um, and we already know uh, that many woodland bird species um, have been shown time and time again to respond negatively to um, the loss of these components. Um, I also did invertebrate surveys and um, they showed that for a given area, uh, the invertebrate loads are also lower in degraded black box. Um, that's mainly as a result of there being less canopy cover um, in black box as well. Um, so there's fewer uh, potential food resources as well. So, so birds are responding to both changes in resources uh, and changes in structural habitat components um, between healthy and degraded um, black box. And unsurprisingly, as those um, things that they require disappear, um, the birds start to drop out and you, and you lose that distinct bird community. So um, other analyses have shown that um, uh, records of birds between habitat types, um, uh, they indicate that there's a, a kind of dynamic and um, a kind of cyclical pattern of bird movement between habitats um, as well as between seasons. And a few species in particular um, showed very distinct patterns at a landscape scale. Um, so between autumn and winter, the um, woodland types in which these five species um, were, were most frequently recorded, they changed significantly. So we have um, weebills, uh, thornbill, whistler and two pardalotes um, that were all found um, in greatest numbers in Mali and red gum uh, during autumn. Um, but in winter, they all uh, shifted, um, the peak numbers of these birds shifted to black box sites in winter. Now these birds represent a guild of small to medium uh, insectivorous birds that glean their prey from um, leaves and branches. And their shift in um, uh, preferred habitat type corresponded to a um, noticeable increase in invertebrates present in black box during winter, um, particularly the number of psyllids. Um, now psyllids are small sap sucking insects uh, that in their larval stage excrete uh, sugary protective caps um, known as lerp. Uh, and these invertebrates show large fluctuations in their numbers um, between seasons and uh, between habitat types. So in the winter of 2013, um, we uh, recorded an eruption in the number of um, lerps as well as the number of adult psyllids, the, the winged form. Um, so there was a, a glut of, of carbohydrate in the sugary caps and in, in protein in the actual animals. Um, and uh, this, this increase mirrored that influx of birds into black box habitat we saw um, in winter. And um, considering that uh, during my surveys I recorded these small birds in particular, um, they were foraging up to 90% of their time, 90% of their day was, was spent looking for food. So the abundance of food resources um, is probably likely to be a real limiting factor um, for these birds and, and is likely to be a key driver determining um, their behaviour and their landscape level uh, movements. Um, so clearly some birds are responding to seasonal changes in food resources um, and this kind of indicates there's, there's probably a degree of complementarity between these resources um, and between different woodlands at different times of the year. So black box in winter was obviously providing um, something more than, than Mali was um, at the same time and, and a lot of times of years Mali would be flowering, there'd be different resources scattered um, sequentially throughout the landscape. Um, so the deterioration of black box um, could disrupt that succession um, that you see across seasons that, that woodland birds um, are probably relying on. So clearly if, uh, if these birds are to be maintained in the landscape, especially these small, these small species, um, uh, both floodplain woodlands um, uh, and uh, the woodlands surrounding them are, uh, need to be conserved. Um, and this woodland degradation uh, on the floodplains that we're seeing um, needs to be reversed. Now trials to achieve this um, are already being undertaken by a number of organisations, uh, including uh, the Nature Foundation. 
Um, and as, as Anne went into before, um, they have uh, been using artificial watering um, since 2012 to augment the recovery of the floodplain woodlands that was kick-started during the 2010 and 11 floods. Um, now their watering that they've done um, has increased the survival of black box seedlings by um, uh, up to 95%. Um, uh, they've increased the understory plants, um, it's promoted regrowth and improved the condition of degraded black box woodlands. And in effect, um, this environmental watering has um, brought back a suite of components um, that were the drivers um, maintaining birds at my survey sites. So I found when these things dropped out in degraded woodlands, the birds disappeared as well. And these are the, the exact um, elements that are being brought back um, effectively by environmental watering. So here was an opportunity to explore the potential of uh, watering to restore um, bird communities. Uh, so I, s I went out to um, these four um, sites that the Nature Foundation uh, was watering um, on the Upper Murray floodplains, um, and I compared the uh, watered black box sites, um, the bird communities there, these ones in orange, to uh, my sites during the same season using a diversity index uh, which quantifies kind of richness and abundance of species at each site. And <clears throat> the most obvious outcome is that the watered sites um, had the highest bird diversity of any habitat category, even higher than a uh, healthy black box, um, whereas the diversity of all other sites, um, bar of course um, our, our friend, the degraded black box, were, were roughly the same. Um, now, the underlying reasons for this aren't entirely um, clear and, and ha haven't um, formed the, a large part of my study, but um, one explanation um, for which there's some evidence is that um, these pulses of environmental water may actually increase short-term productivity um, of a floodplain woodland uh, compared with a stand of trees that's healthy but just subsisting on rainfall, um, much like how the flooding and drying cycles of uh, wetlands increases their productivity as well. So, more research into this um, could reveal some really interesting results and uh, have um, pretty important implications in maintaining um, productive uh, communities on the floodplains. Um, uh, now, the majority of woodland birds at these sites um, were found using the extensive canopy regrowth in trees, um, but young trees less than three metres tall were also being used um, by small birds. Um, and the fresh regrowth had uh, a lot of lerps and psyllids on already, even in, even in fairly young trees. And then these um, amazing stands of black box seedlings um, that Anne showed before, that are uh, recruiting in incredible numbers, um, less than five years old, um, had already created a dense understory that was being used by uh, variegated and superb fairy wrens, um, uh, particularly when there was no other shrub, shrub uh, layer in the area. So it shows that even in um, really highly degraded areas um, where mature trees might have died um, and shrub layers might be minimal, a large influx of environmental water can really kickstart seeding growth and very rapidly um, provide beneficial outcomes for woodland birds. So uh, what are the implications? Well, um, we can see that taking action to restore habitat structure and resources in these environments for birds um, can restore the bird communities, but we need to know what resources the birds use um, and what components that will bring them back, um, and then we need to effectively manage uh, environmental water to maintain those drivers uh, and restore degraded black box woodlands um, to keep the birds in the landscape and uh, hopefully let um, some other student at some point uh, enjoy and tear their hair out uh, studying these, these systems. So that's, that's my talk. Thanks, guys. But I guess a comment or a question, funny enough. Um, it does, I guess, bring to mind we've got a uh, healthy Mallee which supports more birds than a degraded black box. So mm. Mm. we'd need to start asking what sort of questions and what, what, what sort of ecosystems we want to support. And are we, are we talking about attrition here? Oh, yeah, uh, well, well, well. <laughs> that novel ecosystems and taking it to the next. Are we trying to say is Mallee going to be more supportive? than a degraded black box should be moved that way. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean potentially that's, that's something, that's a conversation you have to have. Um, there are birds that are found in um, black box woodlands in high numbers that aren't found in the Mallee and that aren't found in Redgum. Um, and the, the community there is unique. Um, so you've got to argue, like, it, do, we, do we need to maintain that or can we let that go because the birds might be surviving elsewhere? Um, yeah, it's, it's one of those things. For us to think about Absolutely. Hard ones, but yeah. Cheers. Oh, yeah, sure.